Good morning. Morning. Good morning and a very warm welcome. I hope I sound better in the new, new sound system that has been installed. Let's start our service with a word of prayer. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. Lord, we need you this morning. More than anything else, more than anybody else, we need you this morning, Lord. Father, we pray that you come. Do something in our lives. We open it, op open it up to you, Lord. Do something in our lives. Father, we pray that you come. We welcome you here. This is yours, Lord. This is all about you. Just come. Fill us. Speak to us. We yield to you this morning, Lord. Mold us, Father. Break us. We surrender ourselves. Father, take control of our lives and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Shall we all stand and sing our first song as the music plays along, Be Thou My Vision. ourselves as individuals and for this church. Riches I need not for next. Didn't get time to check. Riches I need not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only the first in my heart, my King of heaven, my treasure. 
Do be seated and welcome to our children's focus on this bright and sunny morning. Welcome to any visitors we have here and welcome to those watching online today or later in the week. I'm going to read some song words to you first. They're written for the roots material that the children have and follow. There is a tune, but I'm not going to attempt to sing it because it's a children's song and it's one that we haven't sung for a long time. But the words are fitting for the theme. This story's so big, so good and amazing. It tells us that Jesus is king. Transforming his face, his clothes and his body so everyone knows he is king. Yes, Jesus is good. His love is so good. His acts are amazing and new. This story is so big, so good and amazing. It tells us that Jesus is king. Now, talking to the children and grown-ups as well, how many of you have been up a mountain? Anyone? A few of you. Well, if you have never been, I'd like you to imagine now what it may be like and how you might feel. In today's passage, we hear about Jesus going up a mountain and what happened. This story is called the Transfiguration. And transfiguration means complete change of appearance into a more beautiful look. Jesus went up a higher mountain with some of his closest friends, Peter, James, and John. And when they got to the top, Jesus' appearance suddenly changed. His face shone brightly and his clothes dazzled white. So he was wearing, he was wearing white clothes. I don't have a torch, but can you imagine his clothes and his face was shining like that? Suddenly, Moses and Elijah, they were important people from the Old Testament, appeared and they were talking to Jesus. And Peter spoke to Jesus, asking if he could make three shelters, one for each of them. And then a bright cloud moved over them and a voice spoke. This is my son. I am so pleased with him. Listen to him. Peter, James and John were frightened and fell to the ground. Jesus then came over to them, touching and comforting them and saying, Get up, don't be afraid. They got up, looked around and Moses and Elijah had vanished. So James, Peter and John and Jesus went back down the mountain together. Jesus asked them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man was raised from the dead. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. He was describing that he was going to die and come back to life. And only then could the disciples tell other people what they had seen. I want you to imagine yourself now what it might have been like up that mountain with Jesus and how you would have felt. Would you have been excited, frightened, scared? What would you say or do? How do you think the disciples felt? Do you think they would have wanted to tell the rest of the disciples about their experience? I'll leave those thoughts with you to think about this week. And children, you will hear more about this story in junior church today. Jesus is a wonderful and blessed gift that we have, and we don't have to go up a mountain to see it. We can have special times with Jesus in lots of different places. Children, do you have a special place at home where you like to think about Jesus and feel close to him, where you might read your Bible and pray? If, you're a par if your parents allow it, you might be able to make a prayer den, maybe in your bedroom or a quiet corner of a room. You could use blankets or sheets and cushions, maybe lay some, some pictures around as well to help you focus. Now, I'd like to invite the children up to move to the side and watch what I'm going to do now. You might see better, because it doesn't always show, show what... Um, is seen. So here I have a glass of water. If you stand here, around this side. 
Okay, so we have a glass of water. And I'm going to put some salt into it. What can you see? What does it look like? It just... Cloudy. <laughs> Cloudy water. <laughs> okay. So now it's supposed to, if you leave it to stand for a while, it will go clear. And even though we can't see the salt, it's there. It's part of the water. In the same way, even if we have times when we don't feel close to God, he's with us. And when we ask God to be with us, he will be close. So if we leave that till later, it probably was during junior church, that salt will completely dissolve so the water will be clear. We're going to say a prayer now. So if you would like to join in the last line with me, okay? When everything is going well and we feel happy, or when we are unsure or unsettled, when things are difficult and things seem dark, thank you, God, that we can be close to you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Uh, we've come to a time of confession. Uh, we'll come before God in an attitude of prayer. Bring anything before God that you have done wrong the past week or so, just that's been troubling your heart. He's more than willing. If we confess our sins, the Bible says he's more than willing to forgive us. Let's join in a prayer which comes up on the screen. A prayer of confession. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoings and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Shall we stand and sing as the recorded music uh, plays a couple of songs? We'll worship him. Oh 
the splendor of the King. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light tries to hide trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God all will see how great how great is our God Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning at the end, beginning at the end. The Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb. every situation we find ourselves in it's grace to help us in our time of need how great is our God sing with me how great is our God oh we'll see how great how great is our God. Yes, Father, you are great, Lord. 
your wonderful god we serve you know the beginning and the end father lord we just thank you because we serve an awesome god who is so faithful in our lives and father every day of our lives help us to crown you lord with many crowns praise and worship and adore your name and lift you up every day of our lives help us to do that father we thank you for this time continue to be with us throughout the service as we listen to your word in jesus name amen please be seated uh, joe will bring us the reading followed by regina who will give us our talk Good morning the reading today is taken from matthew 17 verses 1 to 9 Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except for Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Reading from Exodus 24, verses 12 to the end. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant, Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, wait here for us until we come to you again. For Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain, in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see a good number of you here this morning. Shall we uh, pray as we come to look at God's word? Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you that you are God. We thank you that you bring us to worship you, 
that we can gather this morning, on this beautiful morning, in this beautiful house, to worship you. We ask now, Lord, that you would pour your spirit of flesh on each one of us and help us to be open to what you want to say to each one of us this morning. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we have the story of the Transfiguration this morning. Now, I don't know about you, uh, but if I were to choose a toy, um, Transformers would not be top of my list. Yet over the years, I've had to go from shop to shop, searching for these kind of toys as they appeared frequently on my children's birthday or Christmas list. I must say, I like watching um, them as they play with these toys. Uh, how It amazes me how out of one toy, uh, there's a transformation that happens from one toy. In the one toy, you can have three different toys. One toy changes uh, from being a car uh, to a motorbike and to a, to a boat and so forth and so on. It always fascinates me. Um, but uh, so today, the story of the transfiguration is here with us. It's often said that um, Jesus was transfigured, meaning that he was transformed, that is changed. But what was really going on on this particular day on this mountain top? Was Jesus uh, really changed, or was it the disciples who were changed? And uh, what relevance does this transfiguration story uh, have for us today? Uh, now, this story uh, features in all the three synoptic gospels. In Matthew's account, uh, the transfiguration comes after Peter's confession of Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And after Jesus had told his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer and die at the hands of the authorities. Jesus takes three of his inner circle of friends up a mountain top, and there he is transfigured before them. And Moses and Elijah appear and are talking with him about the coming events of his crucifixion. It is a widely held view that Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets. And that is true because Jesus said himself that he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but rather to fulfill it. Yet the appearance of these two giants of the Old Testament may have an added relevance. Both of them had mysterious deaths. Moses on Mount Nebo and Elijah being taken up to God on chariots of fire. Thus they became known as the deathless ones. They are appearing with Jesus, talking about the upcoming events of the death and resurrection, may be pointing to the fact that Jesus' death would not be the end. He would rise to join the line of the two deathless ones. By his death and resurrection, like Moses, Jesus, he would come and be one who would free us from slavery to sin, just like Moses freed the Israelites from slavery uh, to the Egyptians. Jesus would come. He would come by his death and resurrection and free us from slavery to sin. The transfiguration of Jesus, as it were, it is as it were, an unveiling. We see Jesus, the eternal one, the deathless one, and in him we see the glory and presence of God. So looked at from this perspective, the transfiguration turns out to be more a revelation to the disciples of the divinity and glory of Jesus. So they catch a glimpse of who Jesus really is, the Messiah, the Son, of the living God. Yes, the transfiguration has echoes of Moses' encounter with God on Mount Sinai, as we heard from Joe's reading. There Moses' face shone to reflect the glory of God, yet Moses' glory would fade over time. But the glory of Jesus is from eternity and continues into eternity. It is fadeless. 
And the voice coming out of the cloud makes clear this truth. The disciples hear the very same message, these very same words that they heard at Jesus' baptism at the beginning of his earthly ministry. There, the father was endorsing the launch uh, of uh, his son's earthly ministry. And now the father is endorsing the son as he faces the cross to conclude his earthly ministry. By putting his focus on the response of the disciples to the glorified Jesus, Matthew seems to be pointing us to the transformation that occurs in these disciples as they catch a glimpse of the glory of Jesus. They see his glory and they hear it through the Father's voice. They can never return down that mountain the same people again. These disciples receive a magnified understanding of Jesus. It seems that the transformation lies more with the disciples from seeing Jesus glorified. It's encounters such as these and their life with their master Jesus that would, in the post-resurrection period, compel these disciples to choose to suffer and die for the sake of the gospel. They had seen, they had witnessed amazing things. As John would say in his epistle, referring to Jesus, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, and testify to it, and will proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Now those words, those words can only be from a person who had been so impacted by his encounter with Jesus. These disciples were so passionate because they were convinced of what they had seen and heard. They knew what they had seen and they wanted everyone, they wanted everyone to hear it and they would suffer they would be prepared to suffer persecution and die as they spread the good news of the one whom they had seen, whom they had touched, whom they had heard. So what relevance then has this transfiguration have for us today, coming as it does on this Sunday before Lent? What might we take with us on our Lenten journey from this story of Jesus being transformed, or as it were, the disciples being transformed. Jesus, firstly, Jesus had an inner circle of friends with whom he shared some of his deeply personal moments. The transfiguration is one of those moments. Jesus takes with him Peter, James, and John. The other recorded event when he brought these three disciples with him was in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was facing the cross. That anguish that he faced as he contemplated the cross. He took the three with him. Jesus then is showing us the power of partnering with others, partnering with others on our faith journey. Because we travel not alone, we travel as pilgrims on a journey helping and supporting one another along the way. If our master needed that, we too need the support of our friends. Secondly, the power of affirmation. We see it on the football grounds or in any sport. The fans cheer and you can see these sportsmen being propelled by all this cheering to go forward and score. Jesus, 
here is being affirmed. Just as the Father affirmed him at the beginning of his ministry, at his baptism, here we have echoes of the same words as Jesus prepares for the cross. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. There is power in affirmation to build up strength, not only for the one being affirmed, but for all those who are witnessing it. Yes, these disciples, on hearing God affirming the son, these disciples would be who take the comfort and assurance and have the hope for the future because they had heard it themselves. They were assured that they were following the Son of God and this assurance would carry them beyond Jesus' resurrection into the Acts of the Apostles where these once timid men would rise to great heights and proclaim the gospel in such powerful ways because of what they had seen and heard. They had seen it. They had heard it. They were convinced. And nothing and no one would stop them. And we too have the benefit of their accounts. We have the benefit of our own experiences with God. And like these disciples, this should spare us on to tell the good news of Jesus to those around us. Thirdly, we can learn from this is that fear can paralyze us. We hear in verse 6, when the disciples heard this, that is, the voice from the cloud, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. In this world, there is a lot to instill fear in us. You only need to turn the television on or the radio on or watch on, uh, on the internet. There is no shortage of things to make us afraid. But the presence of Jesus brings us the peace and the comfort. He comes to us and says, do not be afraid. Peace be with you. Why? Because he is in control. He said in John 16, In this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. Ultimately, he is in control of the course of history. He has promised never to leave you nor forsake you. He is an all-powerful God, and nothing that you and I face is beyond his power. We can be assured that whatever we face, he is with us. And sometimes we may not see, but just because we can't see the sun when it's cloudy doesn't mean that the sun is not there. Yes, in our times of darkness, we know that God is there with us and he will sustain us for he keeps his promises. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Just recently, I was in the hairdressers and I just said a silent prayer for God to show me a sign of his presence. Little did I know that in the hairdressers, a lady would come and start talking about Christ. And she started praying and she more or less addressed me and um, it was a, a weary moment. I hadn't even expected that I would have anyone in that particular moment as I prayed that someone would come and just started uh, proclaiming good news and talking about Jesus. And uh, yeah, so he is there. We may not see it, but in our little whispers, we can be assured he hears us. He is there with us. We may not see sometimes, but we be assured, my brothers and sisters, our God is there. He will watch over you. He hears. He sees your ache, your pain, and is not oblivious to it. He is there. He will sustain you. He will strengthen you. He cares. He is all-powerful. 
nothing is impossible for him. Be assured of that. And fourthly, the master takes these three disciples and they are alone with him. We learn from this that as they have time with their master, there is revelation. And we too need to spend time with our Lord in prayer, in scripture study, in meditating on scripture. God will reveal things to us as we abide in his word. That is as true as it is. In Psalm 25, Jesus, the word says, the Lord confides in those who fear him and he makes his covenant known to them. It is true. He reveals things to us as we spend time with, us, with him. And that revelation will transform us. We will never remain the same. We may not see dramatic changes, but those encounters with God in his word, somehow they change us. They transform us. We may not hear the audible voice of God like the disciples did on that mountain, although sometimes God speaks loudly to us, but we catch glimpses of him and we become more sensitive to the Holy Spirit's promptings in our lives. We will grow to know the love of God more and more. And this will give us confidence to go out in faith and put our faith into action, serving those God puts in our path. Because we have been confident, we have heard, we have encountered God, and we know that he is a God who is faithful. He is a God who is real, and he is a God who intervenes in the affairs of man. So as we step into this Lent, studying and meditating on scripture, we may choose to fast as we seek to draw closer to God. He will draw closer to us. And we will indeed be transformed. And that transformation is sure to impact those around us. Only the other day at work, I had been speaking to a customer who came very distressed and agitated. And she, pro she said she would come the following day to speak to me. Before she left, I just said a few words. She came the following day, but she came and she said, well, what you said to me yesterday, I felt a deep sense of peace, and I've really got nothing to say today. And I couldn't believe it, because I didn't think I'd said anything at all. I just said a few words. But I believe it was, having had that time with God in the morning before setting off to work, something of God must have rubbed on, onto her. So we never know, we never know. Because we may not sense that we are changed or something is happening to us. But as we spend time in the presence of God, he is bound to do something in our lives. His presence, something of him, rubs onto us. And as we set out in the world, the world somehow catches a glimpse of that. So yes, something happens when we spend time in the presence of our loving Heavenly Father. We all have different ways we connect with God, whether it's on a walk in the park or in the hills, or whether it's washing up or a set place or area or corner of the house. Um, whatever it is, uh, you know what suits you best. Whatever it is, you do that and have these conversations with God. He is always ready to listen to you. He is always ready to embrace us, is always ready to reveal more of himself to us as we seek him with our whole heart. It is my prayer that like these three disciples on that particular mountain, as we spend time in the presence of God this Lent, he will receive new revelation about who God is and be transformed as you discover other aspects of God that you may not have been aware of just like those disciples. And as we spend more time in God's presence, we take on his image, the image of our Heavenly Father, and we are changed from being self-centered to being other people-centered, changed 
from to being more loving, more generous, and more caring. The more we spend time in prayer and scripture, the more we adopt the image of God, and we are transformed into his likeness, the likeness of our Father. We too can emerge into the world to be instruments of transformation in our families, in our workplaces, in our communities, and indeed in the world at large. Bringing hope where there's despair, comfort where there's pain, suffering and grief, and indeed isn't there so much of it around. We bring peace where there's anxiety and fear. It's not more questions that the world needs. It's not our answers that the world needs. The world is desperately in need of transformation. The transformation that can only come through Jesus. And we are channels of God's transforming power. And may this Lent bring about that transformation in and through us as we go about meeting people and spreading the good news of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Regina, for those powerful words. Shall we take a moment or two to just reflect on what has been spoken to us? Let's pray. Father, in this journey as we proceed each day to reach our destination, Father, we need your support as well as the support of friends and family around us. Father, help us to cheer each other in our journey as we are called to encourage each other and build each other up. We pray that we may be a source of cheer to others and there will be others whom you would appoint to cheer us up. Father, thank you for the assurance that you are with us in our daily walk as we confront with the challenges of the day. Thank you for being with us and guiding us as we navigate through some difficult tasks for each day, Lord. Father, thank you for your heart and your readiness to reveal more of yourself as we seek you, Father. Give us the hunger and give us the thirst to seek you, Lord, that we may have the revelation of who you are in our lives. Father, as we prepare for the Lenten season, we pray that this season of Lent, this 40 days, may not just be another 40 days that will go away, but be a 40 days of meaningful seeking and being in your presence, Father. We pray that 
Lord, this 40 days will help us transform our lives, transform our relationship with you. Help us, Lord. Help us to be mindful of our calling that you have placed in our lives. That we may take things of yours seriously. Father, we pray for our nation this morning. We pray for our leaders. We pray for the cabinet, our council leaders as they tackle with difficult challenges before them. Father, we ask for your wisdom to be upon the leaders, Lord. In the same way we pray for the church leaders of different denominations in the United Kingdom. Father, we just pray that they will have your wisdom to speak and lead in these difficult times. Father, we pray for all those who are unwell, especially for Ruby in hospital and for Ron, who is recovering at home. Molly Kidzia, Mary Thomas, Emmy Philby, and Tony Peters, the brother of Christine Heal. Father, we pray that you will touch them, Lord. You will strengthen them wherever they are. Father, we pray for your nail-pierced hand to be placed upon them and to heal them. Father, we pray for bereaved, especially for Hilary G. and her family after the death of her mother, for Andrew Payne and his family on the death of their mother, for Tony Suffolk's sister and brother, Anita and Barry. Father, Lord, we just pray that you will be their comfort. during this difficult time of losing a loved one. Father, we pray for each one here who is sitting here, Father. You know their hearts and you know their circumstances and you know their need. Father, we just pray that you will come through for them at the time of need. The daunting challenges that they are facing. The overwhelming situations that they are in. Father, we just pray that you will send help. Father, there may be people who are sitting here with questions in their heart. Father, we just pray that you will meet them at the point of their need. We pray for Amanda and we pray for Regina, we pray for Brian. We pray for all those who are involved in ministry here. We pray for the children's ministry, the Inspire. Father, we just pray for our young people. Lord, we pray that they will know you. They will learn to know your ways as they grow up and to hold on to it, Father. Father, we just give you all the glory this morning. We thank you and we worship you. We praise you, Lord. We pray for all those people who couldn't attend today. All those who are unwell, whom we do not know. Father, we just pray for their health and for their healing and restoration. Father, we pray for the people of Turkey and Syria. Father, we pray that the aid will reach them at this difficult time where people have lost their houses, lost their everything, Father. 
Father, we pray for your comfort. Father, we just pray that you will send the right material that is required for them, Lord. People who are hungry without food. Father, we just pray that you will set it up in such a way that, Lord, all those challenges that are there, political challenges that are there to reach to those difficult areas will be removed. And that food and provision and shelter will reach them, Lord. Father, we give everything into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we stand and sing as we sing? This is our last song. It's an offertory hymn. Uh, the basket will come around if you want to give to the ministry of this church. Please do so.
please be seated. Amanda will come and give us our announcements. Sorry. Just a couple of things to remind you of. Um, this Tuesday is Shrove Tuesday, and most years, apart from the last three, we have gone at the invitation of Esther down at the Oval Tavern and joined in Pancake Shrove Tuesday races. And um, fortunately, I've never had to do a race, but Brian's done one when <laughs> normally other people have raced. But I volunteered to do the three-legged race this year with somebody. Um, I think it's at 6.30. I say I think because Esther sent me the invitation this morning at about half past seven and um, didn't give me a time, but it used to be 6.30 down at the Oval Tavern. And if, even if we don't join in, there's usually about five different organisations who race against each other, and St Mary's, the local church, is one of them. And uh, I think es uh, Emma won one last year when she, we actually ran all the way around the Oval, which is quite a long way around, actually, and Emma came first. But even if we don't race, she's invited us all for pancakes, which is quite a nice thing to do, really, with people actually in our parish and in our community. So take it from me that I think it's 6.30. If I'm wrong, I'll, we'll send out a, a time, a, a changed time. Just come along. Don't panic. You don't have to race, but I might ask you to do the three-legged race with me. <laughs> and then on Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent, we have a service in the evening here for one hour at 7.30. So if you'd like to come for that, you're really welcome here. And I do apologise again for our heating. We are waiting for a new fan to go into our boiler. And um, unless the company, which it seems that they haven't, have got one in stock, it's a six-week wait to get it imported. And we've waited a week and a half now. So um, if anybody, we've got one, I've got my two outdoor heaters in here and somebody's going to bring their big patio heater for next week. If anybody else has got such a, a heater at home that you could lend the church for the next two to three weeks, that would be really helpful because it is chilly in here. I can tell you, having been out in the hall for the last half hour, it's much colder in here. So thank you for enduring. Um, there is Café Matinee this Thursday afternoon, and the film, the movie is... What's the movie, Chris? Here it is. It says here, The Mona Lisa Smile, which is quite a fun movie. It's Julia Roberts and Dominic West. That's this Thursday afternoon uh, at uh, 2 o'clock here in church when you have a proper interval with cake and uh, tea and coffee and stuff. Um, most of you are probably at work, but for those of you who, are not, who aren't, it's a really good way of getting to meet new people in our community. If you're interested in finding out more about the Holy Holiday Club this summer, ask Val. Um, and if you think you can give up some time for that Holiday Club, please tell Val. It's such a great event, and we have to start publicising it now because um, we need to see what our volunteer base will be so we know how many children we can invite. And then I have some bands of marriage to read for today. So I publish the bands of marriage between Alison Elizabeth Holland of this parish and Charles Benson of the parish of St. Edward's King Confessor, New Addington, to be married at St. Luke's Church, Woodside, due to Alison's qualifying connection there. This is for the second time of asking. If any of you here know any reason in law why Alison and Charlie may not marry each other, you are to declare it. Let's pray for Alison and Charlie. Father, we thank you for the gift of marriage. We thank you for Alison and Charlie, and we pray for them that as they come to their wedding day, you will strengthen them in their faith in you, increase their love for one another, and give them joy on their wedding day. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Now for the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you. Have a lovely week ahead. God bless you.